All right, well, if you have a Bible with you, I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, the uh, ushers have some Bibles there in the back. Sorry, I meant to give that to you earlier. Congratulations. Uh, The ushers have Bibles. Just wave to them. They'll get one to you. You're going to want one with you this morning. If you're visiting, here's what you need to know. One of the things about Grace Point is that when we, right up here in the front, you've got a waving hand. There you go. (laughs) One of the things you need to know about us is that when we get together, when we teach, we're not just teaching some nice ideas. We're not teaching self-improvement or uh, uh, positive thinking. We're teaching God's Word. Right? That's really what this is all about. And, and so we're going to be digging over these next number of weeks through, through the book of Hebrews. So you're going to want your Bible with you as we go, as we go through the series. You know, I love hearing people's stories. It's one of the great benefits of being a part of a church community is you get to hear stories. You get to see lives being transformed and changed. And it's been a joy to hear the stories from our elders. And I want you to think back about Dennis's video. Ignore the fact that he's uh, from Alabama. Uh, at one point in time, he said, in the, you know, when he was kind of at that point, there was, there was a question in his mind where he goes to the football field, he stands out there, and he says, God, if you're there. And I want to ask you this question. Have you ever found yourself in that place? Whether before you became a Christian or even after you became a Christian, where you started asking some hard questions started wrestling with, with doubts, maybe questions like, is, is this, did this all really happen? Do I really believe this is true? Have you ever found yourself asking yourself those questions? My guess is, and it's a guess, but I think it's an educated one, is that 100% of us in this room have found ourselves at that place at some point in time, even as Christians. I mean, that's a reality. Uh, you know, some, for some people, that's a frightening thing. Some people think that uh, to be a good Christian means to not have doubts, it means to not have questions, to not wrestle with any of those things. But in my mind, that's the same as saying to be a good Christian means that you never have any fear. You never get worried, you never have stress, you never get anxious about anything. I mean, reality is, is we've all faced, we all deal with fears, we all deal with stress and anxiety. See, to be a good Christian doesn't mean you never deal with those things. Here's what it means to be a good Christian. It means you know where to take them and you take them there. Being a good Christian isn't about not having questions and doubts. It's about knowing where to take them and actually taking them to that place. Elizabeth Elliot, you remember there was a movie that came out a few years back. It was called uh, The End of the Spear, I think. It's a story about missionaries who were going down into Ecuador and trying to reach out into uh, the, the jungles there to reach the tribes. And her husband, Jim Elliott, went down and they, he ended up being killed. And she says this, she says, faith does not eliminate questions, but faith knows where to take them. Faith doesn't eliminate questions, but it knows where to take them. We come to the book of Hebrews where actually the people that are being written to are people like you, people like me, people like us. People who are dealing with questions, they're wrestling with questions and doubts. The, the reason it's called Hebrews is because it's written to Hebrews. It's written to Jewish Christians, Messianic Jews. You remember at the very beginning of the church, go back to Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. Where does the church kick off? It's in Jerusalem. Right? The Holy Spirit comes on the disciples. Peter goes out and he preaches a message. And 3,000, 3,000 people that first day come to Christ they're baptized which can you be imagine being at that baptism service 3,000 people lives are changed the church gets started but these are Jewish people that are coming to faith and think about how profound that is for just a moment because 50 days earlier in the same city those people were actually saying two words crucify him Right, it's the time of the Passover. Jesus comes to Jerusalem. He's accused. He's arrested. They have the opportunity. Are you going to take Jesus or there's a criminal that they're being kind of, he's being held up to? Jesus or Barabbas? And they say, give us Barabbas. Crucify him. Fifty days go by and a radical transformation happens and thousands of Jews put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and are baptized. And there's the start of the church. But at the same time as there's people who are putting their, at the same time as there are thousands of Jewish people putting their faith and trust in Jesus, there's thousands of people who have rejected it, who want nothing to do with it. You've got a long history and tradition. You've got the law. You've got Moses. You've got the prophets. 
These are things that the people of Israel have, have had and have held on to. And now Jesus comes, and you've got brothers and sisters, friends and family members who are turning and saying, no longer are we following the Jewish, the, the Old Testament, but we're following this Jesus. And think about the response to that. I mean, I hear people today, honestly, who come from other traditions, who come to Grace Point, and they talk about the pressure from family and friends who are saying, how can you go there? How can you be a part of the evangelical Christianity? Right? We have our tradition. We have our beliefs. We have our background. We've got our family. We've got all of that. How could you turn away from that? That was happening as so much more at this point in time, all of this pressure that's being put on these people who've put their faith and trust in Jesus saying, how could you turn from the Old Testament? How could you turn from the law? How could you turn from the prophets? How could you turn from, from Moses to follow this Jesus who was crucified? And so they're having all of this pressure put on them. And at, as they're having this pressure put on them, of course, they start asking some questions. Is this really true? Is Jesus really who we've believed? Is it possible we've believed something that is just made up, that it's just a story, and that we've abandoned the truth for a lie? Is that possible? And so the writer of Hebrews is coming to those people, those questions, those doubts, and he's saying, hey, listen, you've got questions and you've got doubts. That's just reality. But let's not ignore it. Let's not pretend that that's not really happening. Let's take it to the right place. Right? And the place that the writer of Hebrews takes it ultimately is to God's Word. He says, let's go to God's Word. Let's go to the Old Testament. Let's go to the Old Covenant because, again, what's happening is you've got Old Covenant and Old Testament is really saying the same thing. You've got the Old Covenant, the Law and Moses, the prophets. You have all of that. And the New Testament is the New Covenant. Jesus, the Gospel, His life, death, and resurrection. You've got those two being held up to each other. And what you've got is some people are saying, no, the, this is the truth. The old covenant is the truth. That's the way. That's how we're to live. You can't abandon that. And then you've got the, uh, the, the, those who have believed in Jesus saying, no, this is the way. And you've got these two being held up together. And what the writer of Hebrews is doing is saying, okay, let's hold them up together for a moment. Let's look at God's word and what it has to say. And here's how I want you to think about the book of Hebrews. In Luke chapter 24, you've got, two, you've got some disciples who are walking on the road to Emmaus. And they're dealing with questions and doubts. Jesus has been crucified and he's been buried. They've heard that he's risen from the dead, but they're not convinced. Jesus comes walking up alongside of them as they're on the road and he begins asking them questions. They seem a little bit down. He asks them about what's going on. And, and it's, it's actually a kind of a funny interaction. Because they said, well, haven't you heard about the things that have been going on in Jerusalem in these last days? And he says, well, what things? He's been at the center of all of them. I mean, it's been him. That's what's been happening. What things? And they go on about how, well, Jesus came and we thought he was the Messiah, but now he's been crucified and buried. And some of our women said that he'd risen from the dead, but... And they've got questions and doubts. And what does Jesus do? He takes them, again, it's not about ignoring those questions and doubts, but knowing where to take them. And he takes them to the right place. And let me just read exactly what it says to you because I think it's pretty amazing. Luke chapter 24, listen to what, it, what happens. It says, so was it not necessary? And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now stop and think about this. Again, we're talking comparison the Old Covenant, Moses and the prophets to the New Covenant. And they've said, we thought, but we have questions and doubts. And what's the first thing that Jesus says? He says, let's talk about the prophets, those foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And listen, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. In other words, Jesus here on the road says, hey, listen, you've got questions or doubts. Let's take it to the right place. And where does he take them? He takes them to scripture. And at this time, scripture is the Old Testament. He gives them a Bible study on the road and he says, look at the Old Testament. Look at Moses. Look at the prophets. And here's what you need to know. Jesus says, it all points to me. I've heard some people say, boy, I wish I could have been there. I wish I could have heard Jesus' you know, interpretation as he went through the Old Testament, showing them how it all pointed to them. Well, that's what Hebrews is. Not literally, 
But what it's not actually somebody's writing down, here's all the words that Jesus said. This is a letter that's written to Jewish Christians much later on, 40 to 70 A.D., close to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But this is really what we're getting is Jesus' Bible study on the road to Emmaus. Because what the writer of Hebrews is doing is saying, hey, listen, yeah, we've got the Old Covenant. Let's take a look at what it says. Let's hold these two things up next to each other. Let's hold the Old Covenant up next to Jesus. And what His ultimate message is this, is that Jesus is not the replacement, but He's the fulfillment. Jesus is the one that the Old Testament has been talking about in every single way. Let's go through, and that's what we're going to do. He says, we're going to go through, and I'm going to start at the very beginning. And we're going to go through, and I'm going to show you how every single piece has been pointing to Jesus. And the ultimate message is, Jesus is what it's, about. it's, 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 what it's all about. You know, there have been times, uh, I've got four boys, and there's times where, uh, through, you know, where we've had these Christmases, and you get these presents, big wrapped boxes, and you, those of us who are parents probably can relate to this, and they, open the, they unwrap the box, they open the box, and then they take the present out, and they play with the box. And you're going, wait a minute, I just gave you this gift over here that I spent all of this money. You're telling me I could have avoided the gift and just given you a wrapped box, and you would have been content? What the writer of Hebrews, in essence, is saying is, listen, the Old Covenant is the wrapping in the box. It's good. But at the end of the day, there's a gift. There's been a gift inside. It's been waiting to come out. Don't just have fun with the box and miss the gift. And at the end of the day, there's one question that we have to keep coming back to, and we'll come back to it over and over again. It's this one question. It's what will you do with Jesus? The writer of Hebrews says, in every single possible way, Jesus is greater. He's what it's been all about. Again, not the replacement, but the fulfillment. He's what everything's been pointing to. The ultimate culmination of all things in Christ, what it's all been leading to, what it will all be leading to in the end. What will you do with Jesus? You have questions and doubts. Well, let's take it to the right place. And that's what we're going to do over these next few weeks. So take a look with me. Hebrews chapter 1. Would you stand with me as we read our passage together this morning? Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He's spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed as the heir of all things, through whom he also, also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name He has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son." And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness and beyond your companions. And... You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe, and you will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same, and your years have no end. To which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? This is God's word. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word to us this morning. I pray that as we look into it, that you, Lord, would teach us and speak to us. There is so much packed in here. Father, we we can't dig as deeply as maybe we at times might want to go. But I pray that we would see clearly your truth. And that more than understand it, God, you would drive it straight into our hearts and use it to transform and change us from the inside out. We pray for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So... <clears throat> the writer of Hebrews is dealing with these questions. He's dealing with these Jewish messianic, right? They're messianic Jews. They're believers. And the pressure that's being put on them and the questions that they're asking, the doubts they're wrestling with, 
And it's interesting, as he holds, he says, let's go to the Word. We're gonna, we want to take these questions and doubts. Let's go to the Word. And what's interesting is the place that he starts. Because if we're dealing with the Old Covenant, we're dealing with Moses and the Law and the Prophets, you'd think that the first place that he would start is with Moses. Let's just go to Moses. Let's go to the Law. And he is, in essence, that's what he's doing. But the question that we ask, obviously, we come to this and we go, okay, so what's this deal with angels? Why does he start there? You read through the rest of the letter and you'll see it. It's very clear that he's talking about the law and he's going to go through the, the, the sacrificial system, the priests, uh, the giving of the All of those things he's going to go through. And why does he start with angels? It seems strange to us, but it's actually, if you understand Jewish tradition, it's not strange at all. Because what the writer of Hebrews do, is doing is he's saying, let's go to the very beginning. Let's go to the very start. According to Jewish tradition, when the law was given, it was given by God to Moses, but it was given by God to Moses through angels. And what these uh, followers of the Old Covenant were saying to these believers, these Christians, is they were really saying is, listen, do you understand how we got the law? You've rejected the law, you've rejected the Old Covenant, you've decided you're going to go after this Jesus, but think about this for a moment. God gave us the law, God gave the law to Moses, but listen, he gave it through angels. And angels are far, I mean, think of the, angels are powerful, angels are superior to us, they're greater. If God would give Moses a law through angels, how can we question that kind of authority? And what the writer of Hebrews says is ultimately, let's think about that for a moment. Let's take a look, let's compare the two, let's talk about angels and let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about who has authority in this case. Who, who, what are you going to do with Jesus? Who has greater authority? Does the angels have greater authority? Or does Jesus have greater authority? And the conclusion, well, let's look at where he starts. Verse 1. Let's start right at the beginning. He says, Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And he leaves out angels at that moment, even though he's going to address them. But listen, he says, In the past, God spoke. And just take a moment and let that soak in. God speaks. He's not silent. He's not disengaged. He's not distant. The only way that we could know him is if he made himself known. And the good news is, is he's made himself known. God has spoken. And he's spoken in many ways. And it's good. It's great. God spoke through the prophets. God spoke through angels. Isn't that wonderful? But then he, he doesn't stop there. Long ago, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But in, and just circle these, those two words. If you've got your Bible, circle the, word, the words, but in. He's saying God has spoken, and that's great, but now there's something greater. In the past, he spoke through angels. In the past, he spoke in many ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Yes, it's good, but at the end of the day, today, in these days, he's spoken to us through his Son, and the Son in every possible way is greater. And that's the whole theme of Hebrews. The Son is greater. The Son is greater. The Son is greater. Yes, it's great. You have the old covenant. Again, Jesus is not the replacement, but the fulfillment. It's not a bad. The law was not bad. The old covenant was not evil. The old covenant, it's not as if the writer of Hebrews is coming and saying, man, you really follow the old covenant? That's a whole book of lies and something to be ignored because now we have the truth. No, he's saying in the past you had the wrapping and the box and now we've opened it up and we've got the full gift and the gift is Jesus. Far greater than the wrapping, far greater than the box, far greater than anything that you can look at. And he says, let's start at the beginning. Let's start with angels. Because in every possible way, Jesus is greater than angels. He has a greater authority and therefore he's the one you should be listening to. He's the one who you should be following. And he goes through. And let me just give you three ways that he's greater. He says he's greater in nature, he's greater in power, and he's greater in position. What will you do with Jesus? So number one, he's greater in nature. Take a look how he continues. He says, In these last days, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications he sat for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Everything from this point forward, from verse 5 on, is an expansion of what he's taught in these first few verses. So we're going to live in these first few verses and we're going to bring in the other verses because he's just building off of what he's saying in these moments. So number one, he says he's greater in nature. How so? Well, look at how he starts. He says, through whom he also created. He says, let's start with the fact that Jesus is the one through whom all things have been created. He's the creator. He's not a created being. In fact, in Colossians 
chapter 1, let me just... Let me just read this to you. Paul writes this. He says, speaking of Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. And listen, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. There is nothing that has been created that was not created through Jesus. And what does that mean? It means that Jesus wasn't a created being He is the creator. Which the second point there in your notes is, number one, he's creator. Number two, he's eternal. He has no beginning and he has no end. If nothing that was created was created apart from being created through him, then there's no way that he could be created. Because he's the creator. He's the one through whom everything was created. It's John chapter 1. He says, in the beginning was the word... And the Word was with God. In the beginning, the Word already existed. Jesus is the Word, and He already was. He has no start. He, ha- he wasn't created. He's not as if, it's not as if, as some have taught, that Jesus is a greater angel who was created in advance, ahead of time, before everything else was created, and then God created through Him. He's not a created being. He has no beginning. He's eternal. He has no end. In verse 10, listen to what verse 10 says here in Hebrews chapter 1. Take a look at it. Verse 10, it says, You laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. Not only was He there at the beginning, but He will have no end. He is eternal. He's Creator. Angels are created. He's eternal. Angels are finite. At the end of the day, the only possible conclusion when you put all of those things together, even just those few things, what you have is not just that he's greater than the angels. We're dealing with someone who is of the greatest level. This is God himself. Right? It's what John says. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And listen, and the word what? Was God. We're not dealing with anything less than God himself at this moment. Who has greater authority? Right? Look at how he continues. He says in chapter in verse 1, or excuse me, chapter 1, verse uh, verse 3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Just take those two things for a moment. The radiance of his glory, the exact imprint of his nature. Right? What are we what are we talking about in this moment? Well, think about it in human terms for a moment. So I have four sons. When you look at them, some of them you see very clearly, you know whose sons they are. Why? Because there is an, they, they carry a level of identif- they, they, they carry a level of physical representation of who I am with them. Why? Because they're my sons. Right? Some more than others. Some of them look more like their mother than they look like me. There's actually, I don't know if you've seen, there's an app on Facebook now where you can get two pictures, the mother and the father, and a picture of the kid. And it tells you which percentage is in each one of your children, right? And some, again, some of them would have a much higher percentage of Sarah. Some of them have a much higher percentage of me. And that's just physically. Beyond that, you've got other sides of it that you look at my kids and hopefully when they do all the good things, you see me. <laughs> my wife isn't in the room. So hopefully when you see all the bad things, you see the Canadian blood coming out, right? It's, it's cold. It's cold. Uh, <clears throat> There is a sense in which every child carries a likeness to their parent. But here's the amazing thing about Jesus. See, it talks about him being the son. In fact, in verse 5, it says, For which, the, which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And by the, word, why, by the way, that word begotten doesn't mean uh, created. Right? Jesus was, is the begotten son. Why? Because he was born, he was begotten and born of the Virgin Mary. To which of the angels did ever, God ever say, you are my son? To none of them. Why? Because he has one son. Jesus, the son of God, who doesn't just care. It's not like he's the mini version of the father. You look at him and he's got some of the father. It says he is the exact imprint. He is a perfect representation. It's like looking through a window into heaven. That when you look at Jesus, here's who you see. You get to see the father. Jesus says, I don't do anything unless I see the father doing it. What the son loves, the father loves. What the father hates, the son hates. They are unified. They're together. Father and Son. He's the exact, it says the exact imprint. So what does that word imprint mean? Well, at those point, in t- at the, and we actually still have it today, but there came out, I think it was around uh, 700 B.C., people began to imprint on coins. 
right? If a king or a ruler wanted to, people to know who was in charge and who, what this kingdom was really all about, they would have a picture of themselves imprinted, stamped onto a coin. Back around 700 BC, in fact, you can go on, I went on, I should grab some of the pictures. You go on, you get to see some of those imprints, and they're not very good representations of those people, right? Why? Because at the beginning, they didn't have the technology that we have today. Today, you look at some of those brand new coins, and it's like a 3D image. In essence, that's what we're getting here. In the past, we had, there are things that we could look at, and we could see reflections of who God was, but they were imperfect, They weren't the fullness of it. Even in creation, we're told in Romans 1, they were able to see the invisible attributes of God in creation. Evidence of His presence, evidence of who He is, His nature. But what the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, listen, when you look at Jesus, you don't get to just see a little bit of who He is. You get to see Him. If you've seen the Son, then you've seen the Father. But because they're united, they're together. And at the same time, there's a distinctness here. Why? Because he's not saying, hey, listen, to whom did I say I went from being the father to being the son? What we have here in this moment is you have the father and the son. You have this sense in which they're completely unified and yet they're distinct. And what we're getting here in this moment is we're getting the Trinity. Right? It's not a word. The word Trinity is never used in the Bible. You'll never find it there. If you even do, if you do a word search, you won't find it. But we see it throughout Scripture. We see this presence of the fact that there is there's one God, but yet there's multiples. Not multiple gods, right? But you have Father and you have Son, and we also know that there's the Holy Spirit. And there's this essence in which there's three, and yet at the same time, it's not as if we have three gods. There's one God. There's only one God that we worship. That's what the Trinity is. God is, think about this for just a moment, and this is so deep, it's beyond our grasp. Trust me, you can spend the rest of your life thinking about this and never be able to get to the bottom of understanding it completely. But God is so one that we don't have three separate gods, but He's so three that we don't have one God who becomes father, who goes from being Father to becoming Son to becoming Spirit. He's so th- one that He's not three gods. He's so three that He's not one God who takes on three different forms. He's one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-eternal, co-equal, completely and totally unified and yet distinct in their persons, unified in their nature, at the very essence of who they are. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying about Jesus. He's saying, listen, who are we dealing with here? We're not dealing with an angel. We're not dealing with a higher level of angel. We're dealing with very God. the Apostles' Creed. Who is Jesus? He's very God of God. The second person of the Trinity. And so who has greater authority? Who are you listening to? Who's the person that you're going to turn to when you say, what is really true? What should I follow? Where should I go? He says, Jesus is greater in nature. By nature, who is he? He is very God of God. Number two, not only is he greater in nature, he's greater in power. Two things that I'll just point out briefly here. He says, so he says, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Right? Nature being the very core of his being. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And just read the very beginning of the next sentence after making purifications for sins. He sat down at the right hand. He says, let me tell you two things about the power of this Jesus that we're talking about. Number one, he holds all of this together. Not only is it that he created it, but he sustains it by the word of his power. The word, just a word. By what comes out of his mouth, he holds all of this together. I mean, think about the intricacies of our universe, of what we know about it, and everything that has to be in place in order for you to live, breathe another day. All right, if the earth is 10% closer to the sun, we burn up. If the earth is 10% further away, we freeze up. And yet, it's still, it's continuous. It goes, it keeps spinning, it keeps going around the sun, it stays close to the sun. And we say, well, how is it that we have this consistency and this certainty? We don't go out today and wonder if the sun's going to be there. We know it's going to be there. And yes, science says, well, there are laws and it all holds together. Well, behind the laws is a lawmaker. It's the one who holds it all together. Jesus Christ, who created it and holds it together. And not only does he hold it together, but he's also the one who redeems it. It says, and after making purification for sins, and in that one short statement, you have such deep and profound, it's absolutely astonishing, such deep and profound truth in one statement. And I know I don't even have time to go into it all. 
But in that one phrase, here's what you have. Jesus Christ, God the Son, the Son of God, took on flesh and blood. He came and lived a perfect life, went to the cross, and died the death, paying the penalty for our sins. What angel did that? None. What angel could do it? None. But it didn't stop there. He died. He was buried. He rose again. He conquers sin and death. He defeats death. And listen to this. He does it by his own power. He says, no one takes my life, I lay it down. And I lay it down, I have the authority to take it back up. He says, there is no angel that has that kind of power. There is no power like his. He's greater in nature, he's greater in power, and he's also greater in position. One of the arguments that could come up as we think about Jesus and we talk about, well, he's, got, you know, he's the son of God and he's greater in nature, someone might say, yeah, but if he died and he then he had to have taken on flesh and blood. So if he took on flesh and blood, then isn't he just a man like us? And isn't that, doesn't that mean that he's less than the angels? And the writer of Hebrews would say, well, yes, he did take on flesh and blood, but what we're not dealing, we're not dealing with nature. He didn't change nature. He was still the son of God. We're dealing with position. Yes, Philippians 2, he humbled himself. He took on the form of a man. He took on the form of a servant. It was a positional transition, not a nature transition. He remained the Son of God. He took on flesh and blood, took on the form of a servant. He served us. But understand, that positional change was temporary because what's the result? The result is this. After making a purification for sins, after serving, after humbling himself and serving us by taking on flesh and blood and dying the death we deserve, rising again, conquering sin and death... He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Jesus is exalted. He's given the name above every other name. Yes, he took the position of a servant, but he rose again. He conquered sin and death, and it says he's seated at the right hand of the Father. There is no angel seated at the right hand of the Father. No one is given the place of honor and privilege except for one, and it's the Son himself. And in sitting at the right hand of the Father, He's sitting on the throne. Verse, verse 8 says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever in the scepter of uprightness and the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. At the end of the day, Jesus is seated. After having served, He rose, was exalted, is seated at the right hand of the Father in the place of honor and of power, seated on the throne where He rules and reigns till the Father makes His enemies a footstool for His feet. And at that throne, do you know what happens around that throne? Revelation chapter 5 tells us. Do you know who bows down and worships before the throne? Angels. So the angels, he says, right? What was it? Verse 5, verse 6. And again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels worship him at the coming of Jesus into the world, being born of the Virgin Mary. What do the angels do? They show up to worship. And when Jesus returns to the, to, to his th- and is seated on the throne, what do they do? They show up to worship. Why? Because He's greater. He's greater. He's greater. He's greater. He is creator. They are created. He is infinite. They are finite. He's the Son of God and they're servants of His. He's the sender. They're the messengers. Whose authority do you listen to? He's the one who has the power, who holds it all together. He is the one who has the power, who redeems it all, who has died and risen again, who laid down his life and took it back up. There is no angel who does that. They serve those who are being redeemed by the Redeemer. He is the one exalted. He is the one seated on the throne. He is the one who rules and reigns, and they are the ones who worship before him, who serve his purposes. Are they not? The very conclusion, verse 14, what does it say? He says, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Jesus is the purchaser and the author of salvation. They're the ones who serve those who are being saved. And so at the end of the day, he says, he's greater, he's greater, he's greater. So now here's the question, what will you do with Jesus? What what will you do with Jesus? And at the end of the day, we can hold him up next to anything. What will you do with Jesus? And you can't get around that question because at the heart and the center of Christianity is this one person. Jesus, the Son of God who took on flesh and blood to come and do for you what you could not do for yourself, to lay down His life, to take it back up, to, pay, to make purification for your sins, not His own. So that you could believe, repent, and surrender control to the King who is seated on the throne, who alone is worthy. And the question is, what will you do with Him? 
See, if he's not, and at the end of the day, it's the question of do you believe it or not? Because if he's not those things, then you should run the other way as fast as you can. Don't waste another moment on him. But if he is, he's worthy of more than you showing up on a Sunday morning and listening to a message and nodding your head. Do you know what he's worthy of? He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he's worthy of nothing less than your life surrendered in faith. You know, believing, believing is more than just what happens up here. We're to believe with our hearts. And when we talk about the heart, we're talking about the very control center of your life. To believe is to give the control center of your life over to Jesus Christ. And so the question is, what will you do with Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus, who is the Savior, who has always been and always will be, King of kings and Lord of lords.